And we're back. We're back, bumblebees. Oh, he did it. <laughs> I was putting the energy out there hoping that you would do it. <laughs> we're back again, guys, with Mike, Katie. Hi. How Pleasure. You, you guys enjoying Florida? It's it, it, it's had its ups and downs. <laughs> yeah. Like, so right now, back in Iowa, like eight inches of snow here, weird weather patterns. Yeah. So no matter where you are, here you are. And a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of uh, phone issues down here compared to what we have. Who do you guys have? Verizon. Verizon. It shouldn't be a problem then. You it shouldn't be. Yeah. We uh, had a plethora of people outside the Verizon store this morning because we were trying to get on calls and we just oh no that's service so that's a Verizon problem and, because okay. of the storm up there then. Yep. There was an angry mob. Well, here like we went to the Verizon store just to get on like a useful Wi-Fi and there was an angry mob standing in front of Verizon and the lady you could kind of just see panic washed over her face not knowing how to handle the situation. It's like. We're fine. We'll just stand out here. Everything's everything's okay. Yeah. That's wild to me. Whenever my phone doesn't work, I just Google it. <laughs> Is there an outage? What what are you gonna do yelling at a rep? Yeah. Yeah, there was some kind of like tower issue. She's like, they're working. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah when Hurricane Ian hit, T Mobile was the only thing that had worked. Yeah. And we just switched like three mm -hmm. weeks before from Verizon to T Mobile because my house is a, a dead spot for Verizon. And there's a tower one point four miles from my house. Yeah. Okay. I should have no problem with Verizon anything. You would think. But I do. Yeah. Couldn't get it. I'd have to stand in the middle of the street to get a bar. It, it was hurricane. weird. Yeah. Anywhere with Verizon. Yeah. A, around my, my house, there was nothing. It was just in the middle of my road was the only place I can get a signal. Yeah. So, but T-Mobile is perfect. I can do everything in the house. So we switched to T-Mobile and I'm not having internet or cell phone issues right now either. So. Yep. <laughs> we're gonna go doomsday prepper we're going all satellite yeah. uh, satellite you should have one of those yeah. Movies, yeah didn't the moon landing happen in like 1969 yeah the president was able to call the people on the moon from a landline <laughs> <laughs> can't get service in florida that's crazy you also have more technology in your phone than what they had right to send people to space oh yeah i am really going down that hole i think the moon landing was faked mm-hmm I'm yeah. with you on that one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. <laughs> I was a little worried about saying that. No, I'm I'm right there. There's, uh, there's no way. Right? No way. Okay, I, re I could really deep dive that, and I wish you guys lived closer. <laughs> <laughs> we have Zoom as long as we have better internet connection. Yeah. yeah. We'll keep this conversation rolling. Absolutely. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> so, yesterday we did a couple of talks, and... We like really dived your guys' relationships and how you came to feel your relationship and how it came into fruition. Who were you before this? Oh, I was so many different people before all this. Okay. Um, I was a dispatcher for state police mm -hmm. for about nine and a half, ten years. Interesting career. I'm I'm over it now though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it takes a lot. Um, before that, I was I was previously married for five years. Ended badly, <laughs> and then. In between, I just ran a bunch of businesses trying to figure out what I liked, what I didn't like, what worked, what didn't work, and got me to, to here. Yeah. So being a 911 dispatcher, what was that like? It was interesting because where I was, it wasn't just county or like city. We worked out of a major hospital, a trauma oh. center. So on top of the 911 calls, we had to deal with the helicopters coming in. We had to deal with the military coming in. So we got to deal with like the Blackhawks, which was really cool watching those land. And it was nice and it was different from the county because we got to see our calls all the way through. When we had someone calling with a trauma, there were times that we had to leave our dispatch center and go to the ER to assist. So like we got to see a side of those emergency calls that no one else got to see sitting out in 911 because you just took the calls and that was it. We got to know what happened from start to end of all of our calls, which was a little bit more easy to deal with at the end of the day, I think. There's closure in that. It. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very hands-on. Mm -hmm. Mentally, what did that do to you, seeing all of that? It desensitized me yeah. a lot. Um, and it was, I didn't realize it until it got to a point where if you were out with friends doing something and something happened, you're like, okay, what's the big deal? And everyone else is freaking out, but you're just like, it, it just keep going on. You're like, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize how desensitized you get until something major like that happens. Even something like, I remember the football game where the one guy ended up dropping with a heart attack and everyone's freaking out. But you see that six times a day coming through your ER and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And you're like, maybe I need to humanize myself a little bit more. <laughs> is it desensitized or is it normalized? Because that that is life. I think a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, desensitized in the fact that 
you know it should probably affect you a little bit more than it does, mm -hmm. but it you just have to keep moving on. You don't get that chance to sit there and really process it as it's going on because you need to be able to say, okay, you need to go here, you need to go here, because on top of those calls you're taking in, you're also dispatching the police department for that hospital. You're dispatching the security for that hospital. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what's going on. So you have to process six different calls at once and make sure that the people that you have are going to where they need to go. So it's a lot of multitasking, yeah. which is funny because we talk about it all the time because we were in the car last night having conversations, and I'm like, my brain is... 80 different places, but it's such an orchestrated 80 different places mm -hmm. where his may be 80 different places, but they're so organized in their own little world where mine just play together well. So I can jump from one conversation to the next in a split second and still have that process going where he needs that time to process between where we were. Yeah. And I have to remember to like step back and give him that little bit of time to process the different conversations that we're in. A little grace period. Yeah. <laughs> So in having to handle everything in rapid recession like that, did you notice any negative effects in your personal life and the way you dealt with things? Absolutely. Okay. Um, it, it came down to a point that, like we were talking about yesterday, I never realized it until I left and it was a couple months out of that job when I moved down to be with Mike that I was a full-blown alcoholic to a degree. Mm -hmm. Like. Didn't realize it at the time because I was never that person that would sit there and drink heavily to the point that I was intoxicated and couldn't remember anything because I had to always be in control of everything, which comes from part of that that job title for mm -hmm. almost 10 years. But I would still have to have that drink every single night. I would sit there and reevaluate my budget for the week with groceries to make sure that I had that box of wine in my fridge because when I went to bed at night, if I didn't have that giant glass of wine, I wasn't going to bed. Was there anxiety if you didn't have it? Oh, it got to that point. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't at the beginning, which I think is why it took so long for me to realize where I was and the fact that I was there in that life because I didn't have that anxiety at first. But towards mm -hmm. the end of that closing, that nine, 10 year gap, when I was budgeting out to be like, no, I need this. I need to make sure it's in the house that I would start worrying about it before payday even hit to make sure that everything was set. So that one specific thing was there to be able to to rely on. Isn't that crazy to look back at and connect the dots on things? Because you don't see it in, in the process, you especially don't. coming from my past history where my family, we have alcoholics in my family. My biological mm -hmm. father was an alcoholic. My sister struggled for a while and I was very judgmental towards her. And then I realized like I was there too. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the reason why I was mm -hmm. so judgmental. I have to just say, super fucking cool to see you in your element, just sitting here listening to all of it. Yeah, he's absolutely admiring yeah. right now. I'm I, sure one of the cameras is picking it up. It is. He's got his own. <laughs> just smitten. Yeah. I like being the supporting actor. I'm into this. You're in charge now. This is fun for me. <laughs> She's the captain now. Yeah. <laughs> Ride your train. <laughs> fucking get it. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, so you turned to drinking in mm -hmm. a sense. You weren't drowning yourself in it, but there was definitely a mental anguish if you knew that there was a possibility of not having it. Oh, there was a dependency, definitely. Okay. I have so many questions in my mind, and I have to, like, it's like strings on balloons to float <laughs> away if I don't hold on tight enough. So your mental processing, mm -hmm. right? So I can imagine, I can just imagine the traumas that you had to deal with. And it's not just older people having heart attacks. I'm sure there were children or moms and dads, and it's a lot. That's and a the whole hardest. lot more since 2020. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to need you to elaborate on that. I one. can't because we'll get kicked off YouTube. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> you Freedom can't of have speech. The, can't have yeah. those discussions on here. It's yeah. insinuated. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about that half later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So, in witnessing all of that, mm -hmm. I would go as far to say that something like that can chemically change your brain. The way that your brain receptors and whatnot fire mm -hmm. off and the way that you start processing things. How do you feel that that line of work has affected your maturity levels? Oh, immensely. When I started that line of work, I got into it um, when I got, I got divorced. I flew back from, at the time we were in the Middle East mm -hmm. station there, I flew back to join the military to get away from my ex and that didn't work out because I found out I had cancer 
and didn't know it at the time. Like you're going through the process of entering. They do the medical exam. Mm -hmm. And and they go, you're denied. They were like, your blood work is funky. We need you to go in and have a wellness exam, figure out what's going on. Okay. So I went and had regular blood work. Nothing was really popping, but there was levels that were off in my white blood cell counts. So then they sent me to my female doctor. Had that done, um, and they found out that I had cervical cancer. Uh, at the very beginning, it was considered carcinoma in situ, which is the very beginning of cancer. I call it like the fetus cancer. <laughs> it's okay. like before it. But then when they went in deeper, they found out that I was actually stage one and that completely blackballed me from that point on. They're like, we can't take you because there's a chance it could come back in the future. You're too much of a risk. You're you never will be able to join. And now, that was devastating. Now would be a great time for you to plug Matrix and the importance of blood work because that's how they found out that she had cancer. Mm-hmm. So if you guys weren't aware, we are affiliated with Matrix Hormones. I'm sure AJ or... My husband, possibly. We'll put a nice little pop-up for you guys just to remind you. We do have an affiliate link. That camera. So going to our website, not going to our website, going to their website, who referred you. There's a little drop-down box. To be better sent you, you get $150 off. $200 off your initial consultation. $200 off the initial consultation. That is not blood work. Your initial consultation. Good job. Thank you. It's like you're you're hosting the show. (laughs) (laughs) I'm certainly trying. I was looking at the wrong camera for that. That's okay. It's okay. All right. It's because you're used to that camera being yours. I am. I feel so, I don't know, like I'm big dick swinging right now. This is your chair. You usually run it. This is neat. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm taking the day off. I bet it's a nice little break it, for you. It is. I, I told you this morning I'm mentally tired, so. Yeah, you can do all the four-wheel <laughs> thinking over there and whatnot. Yeah. Like well. Not a trailer. Yeah. If it wasn't for the sound that the mics would pick up, if I touched my phone, I would totally be looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, they they found it. Mm -hmm. Um, Had to start going through that process. And that was a whirlwind for me because the two two big jobs that I ever wanted when I was little was I wanted to be a mommy, Mm -hmm. wanted to be a soldier. When I got married, I put that on the back burner to be a wife. That fell through. It was a bad marriage, a lot of cheating on his end, and I just couldn't take it anymore. So that's when I left from overseas to come back stateside to join to do my other dream. And then that got crushed. Mm -hmm. From there, I was like, okay, well, now I need a job. I need to figure something out. And I had a friend that worked at the hospital. I was like, why don't you sign up for this? And I did. And that's it just kind of fell into my lap. And I was really good at it. Thanks to my ADHD, (laughs) it worked really well. And from there, it just it took off. I met like I did everything very well. I made the ranks. I was the one that was training people alongside of my other partner. And I did really enjoy it for a really long time. It was something that for me allowed my mind to kind of just push out because I do great in chaos. Chaos right. was mm-hmm. my my strong power. So I flourished there. But after a while, it just it gets to be a lot that you just don't want to do it anymore. Like, but with the cancer, um, found out that I had it. And they basically said, like, we're going to have to go in. We're going to have to remove tissue. We're going to potentially have to do radiation. We'll schedule out six to eight months. Mm-hmm. Um, in the meantime, just be healthy. And I was like, well, that's that's not me. I can't just let sit here and allow this to grow. Like, that's not going to be okay with me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to deep dive into herbal medicines and figuring out what I could do to help heal me. Mm -hmm. And for those six months between when I found out I was diagnosed to the point that I had to go back in to figure out how far it had gone to be able to start the radiation and chemo process and get on the docket for all that, um, I did six months exclusively of fresh juicing. Mm -hmm. I did not eat a single cooked meal in that time. Everything I did was fresh juice, like seven, eight times a day. And when I went back in, everything was completely cleared. Yep. Cold press too, right? Cold press. Yep. You need a minute to process that. Yep. You've never heard about that? There, there are doctors mm-hmm. in Mexico that are treating cancer with juice. Mm-hmm. Yep. <clears throat> I have not heard about that. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. now going to look into that. That's yeah. insane. It saved me because when I went back in, when I originally started, they were like, so here's the deal. You're 25. There's a chance you'll never be able to bear kids because when we go in to remove the area of tissue that there is, you're going to be weakened you're gonna have scar tissue. Your pregnancies would be so high risk that we would tell you that you should probably get everything taken out because if you got pregnant, you would basically be on bed rest from the moment that it happened till you probably delivered earlier, had to be rushed in for emergency surgery. Wow. And that mm-hmm. crushed me. That's why I was like, I need to find something. That's not an option. I already had one dream taken away. I'm not gonna allow this to be taken away. 
when I went back in after that six months, there was no scar tissue. They couldn't even tell that I ever had the cancer. And it was, it was, it was life altering to know that something that I did for six months that was hard as hell. Like it was not an easy feat to sit there and be like, I have to drink only this cold pressed juice. I have to figure out what juices I need to be drinking and what ones work and what ones don't and how many calories I'm getting a day to make sure that I'm not undernourished during that time was a lot. But it, like I said, it was the most amazing thing that I ever did for my body. I call her my white witch. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually have questions about that mm-hmm. uh, because I do know about it. So um, first of all, how expensive was that? It wasn't that bad, surprisingly. At the time that I went through it, I was in New York. Um, it was the beginning of the year. So a lot of like the citrus fruits were in season. And okay. that's I did a lot of citrus and a lot of celery. My main go-to was celery and green juices. Um, I would have in the morning 32 to 64 ounces of cold pressed celery juice. Yeah. And I hated the taste of it at first. All organic, right? At the time, no, because I couldn't afford all organic. Mm. So I did like if I did any kind of like strawberries, any thin fruit skinned, I would do organic. Um, The celery I did organic only because the salts that are in the celery, that is what help. That to me was important because everything that goes on to there. If I did things like oranges at the time, those I didn't care about as much, only because of the skin on the outside, didn't allow the pesticides to fully get through. So I was very selective on what I did and what I didn't put in that was organic. I just couldn't afford having just left and supporting myself all over again to do fully organic. So it was a split, like 50-50 probably, I'd say. That's why I asked about the cost. People don't realize that when you juice, if you don't go go organic Mm -hmm. and you're not careful about what you're buying, you are taking in a higher concentration of the shit that's Mm -hmm. on your food. Correct. um, Which can actually make you sicker, right? So Mm -hmm. when people do that cold pressed juice thing, it has to be organic. They they say it's supposed to be organic or it can make you sick. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I I, I think is crazy in all of this is that for tens of thousands of years, food has been our medicine. Mm And we don't even eat food anymore. No. Everything is a food-like product. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not like that anywhere else in the world. It's just here. If you go to like Costa Rica and eat and you want to eat like a, a paleo diet, it's just food. Mm-hmm. They don't have any of the shit that we have. Even our friends who live in Canada, they a lot of our food is is restricted there. Mm-hmm. They can't sell it there because it's, it's fucking toxic. Yeah. Well, what's funny about that is, is I actually got bit by a tick about 10, 11 years ago. So Lyme I disease. have alpha gel. Oh, is what I have. So I'm allergic to beef and pork. Still, for, still. Fuck that. Still. It has would... lessened over time, but it's it's still very much there for the beef and pork. And when I went overseas and I traveled to Ireland, I could eat beef and pork. No problem. Never had a single there? reaction. Mm-hmm. Yep. Over in Ireland. Really? No problem. I came back stateside. Can't touch it. I but would, if I'm traveling overseas somewhere, I can eat it no problem. Here, I can't touch it. I would cry if they told me I could never have another cheeseburger. Like, I, I think I would have a mental breakdown over that. I almost mm-hmm. weep into my steak every time <laughs> she has to sit there and watch me consume it. Yeah. Like, Understandable. We, yeah. We yeah. just ordered a cow of grass-fed from a yeah. farm in Florida. They're, we, they're butchering it. We should have it in a month. We have, like, three quarters of a cow, organic poultry, and turkey in the, in the freezer mm-hmm. for not only, like, just in case, but because that's that's how we eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We eat as organic as possible. Mm-hmm. We everything we make is homemade, just yeah. for those reasons. Because of her, uh, she's a fucking vast vault of knowledge for anything nutrition. Because mm-hmm. of all these things, because right. she's had to. Yeah, mm-hmm. we started ordering Icon meals. We've done a couple of different mm-hmm. meal preps. Yep, an Icon meal so far is the only one that I've actually enjoyed eating. Yeah, but we're she she likes to cook. Mm-hmm. She was when when with all this started, she was my chef. Mm-hmm. Chef Boy R Peaches did everything, <laughs> I, and it was all organic. And I, I got down to two hundred pounds. This is the first time I've been two hundred pounds in sixth grade. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, I was I had the V taper. I, my abs were starting to show through. Like I was I was looking good. Yep. And then the podcast took off, and our free time went to zero. Yep. So we DoorDash constantly. I've put on forty pounds in a year. Yeah. So, but we're back at it again. Mm-hmm. But the 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 cow was a big part of it. When I found that, it, I, honestly, it came through as like an ad on Facebook. Yep. And it was just one of those things that, like, I looked at the icon meals, and then they they did the cow thing. I'm like, whole cow. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Had to buy. We're gonna have to buy a bigger deep freezer. We are. Half a cow is 220 pounds of red meat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We we had to get a second. Yeah. We have one specifically just for beef, and then one for like poultry. Yeah. Yeah. Because we just we, there's no way one was enough for right. both of us. <laughs> So it, it works out well, but it's a huge it's a huge difference to sit there and see how the quality of food varies so vastly mm-hmm. between things. 
and between different countries even. Well, even different regions. We had that yeah. conversation yesterday. Like we live in Iowa and obviously we have access to more agriculture, more farmers, mm -hmm. more like small mom, mom and pop that still sell a lot of like their own produce or um, cow farmers that we can just access pretty much at all times. And then you come here, we fly out to California, food is just different. When mm -hmm. you look at where steaks come from in Florida or California or anywhere uh, northeast, Nebraska, Iowa, right. all of them. Well, you get you can get a lot of a lot of cattle in Florida, believe it or not. Can you? Yeah, you get Florida is cattle and oranges. Mm -hmm. You get more Florida orange juice from Thailand than you get from Florida. Mm -hmm. And Florida itself was a cattle state before it became agriculture for oranges. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, have you heard the term Florida cracker? Mm -hmm. And and where the white people being called crackers come from? It comes from Florida. There's um if you go to Fort Myers, there's a road called Tucker's Grade. Mm. Tucker's Grade used to run from the coast to the other coast all the way up to state. So you would go from the southwest coast of Florida to St. Augustine. Mm. And all the Native Americans up there could hear the cattle boy, the cowboys rustling cattle to and from for miles where they got there because of the way the sound traveled through the okay. woods. And that's where that term came from. So Florida is actually a yeah. giant ranch state. So you can get good beef here. But you have to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> for major chain restaurants, they don't want to do that. Yeah. So I'm also a wealth of useless information. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Hell yeah. For anybody interested in the history of Florida, I'd recommend reading A Land Remembered. Yeah. It's a there's really actually, good book. There's actually still a, an active ranch. Mm -hmm. Babcock Ranch is like 30 minutes from here. Yeah. There's still cowboys. It's one of the only ranches in Florida that still have cowboys living on the ranch full time. It's cool shit. Yeah. I have to go out there and take pictures. I thought it was neat. No, absolutely. <laughs> And we love that stuff, like getting these little trips in periodically uh, everywhere we're going to be in the next few months. We like that. We want to be able to set aside a little bit of time to know things like that. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? Like everybody comes to Florida for Disneyland. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Fuck that noise. Give me the Cowboys. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, po like point me in the right direction for like the, the historical shit. Yeah. yeah. Don't go to St. Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn a lot there. There's definitely a lot mm -hmm. of history there, but it is a giant tourist trap. Yes. Yeah. I drank from the fountain of youth and it tasted like tap water. It can't, I, I'm convinced it came out of a hose. <laughs> yeah, that, I was, this is a little dainty spring. You know, like yeah. She puts a little cup underneath there, held it for a second and took a sip. She's like, it tastes like a water hose. I'm like, it probably is a water hose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she asked the people in the gift shop, you can be honest with me. Is there a water hose feeding that spring? And yeah. she's like, no, it's a real spring. I'm like, yeah, okay. It's fucking water. She was so taken aback by me asking her that. <laughs> Um, I can't remember where I was going from that co for that conversation, but y I'm, I'm assuming you know who Barbara O'Neill is. Mm -hmm. I was telling my husband about her because I am deep diving all of the holistic things now. <laughs> I spent like thousands of dollars on herbs and setting mm -hmm. up my apothecary and whatnot. I need a refresher. I don't know who we're talking about. Barbara O'Neill. Yep. She's uh, the Australian woman I told you. Gotcha. About. Yeah. <laughs> So I Googled her just to give him like the Wikipedia rundown of who she is. And the Wikipedia rundown is that she is a crazed woman mm -hmm. who is pushing unethical remedies. It kills me. I, it kills me because these are things that we've used for hundreds of years. But now right. all of a sudden, because it doesn't, you know, it's not big profit pharma. big pharma, it's, big it's pharma. bad. Same thing like when COVID hit and everything was going through and people were like, oh, if you take white pine needles, it'll help. And all of a sudden you couldn't find them anywhere mm -hmm. thankfully i had one in my back backyard so like it helped me greatly and now i i use it all the time we have a pine tree in our yard and i'm like what pine tree do you have he's like i don't know i'm like go out take a picture so i can see the needle so i know what we have and he's like okay so i ran back took a picture and said it and i'm like okay yep we can use that one that one's good that's fantastic <laughs> chris went out riding i was, I was gonna be like, tell her the story babe <laughs> that's why i looked at you and i've been so I'm early into the apothecary and the holistic type thing. So I have found 25 different herbs that I want to work with and really learn and mm -hmm. how to like combine things. I've, I've learned that there's like a triangle that you do when you're making your herbal teas. Like there's supposed to be a supportive one of all these other things. So I found my 25 and one of them was pine needles. And every, I'm of course not near the roads and whatnot, but back in the, in the Florida woods, we have a lot of pine trees. And every time I saw a pine tree, I was like, oh, I need to get pine needles. Like, I don't want to pay for them. They're right there. They're free. Just, and one day he comes home from riding his dirt bike. I think it was with your cousin. Mm. And he was like, I got something for you. I was like, stop it. I thought, cause he's been bringing me feathers and rocks and all these cool things. And he opens it up and I see a little bit of green. I was like, you fucking didn't. And I started crying and he was like, I found you pine needles. And he ripped them off the tree. <laughs> and I saw the GoPro footage of him getting the pine needles. It was absolutely hilarious. He thinks it's the stupidest thing ever. But he did it, and it made me happy, and that was really mm -hmm. neat. 
a lot of our pine trees, the pine is high. Like the needles are high. You can't just go grab them unless they're, they're saplings. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever ridden an e-dirt bike? It has been years. You've ridden a real dirt bike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they make electric dirt bikes now. Good for them. And they look like mountain bikes. Yeah. So you can ride them on mountain bike trails, whether or not mountain bikers enjoy that or not. (laughs) Fuck those guys. (laughs) Um, Because you can rip those trails doing 30 to 70 miles an hour. So I take my bike places where it's not supposed to go Uh and ride mountain bike trails. And I'm fucking zipping through the woods and had to make a secondary loop to go back because I I passed them so quickly that like I didn't want to try to turn around. I was like, just do the loop twice. Yeah. And I came back and stopped and I was like, I can't believe I'm fucking doing this. And my cousin was like, bro, just stop. I was like, I- I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I walked over and grabbed like three giant handfuls you of did. pine needles and crammed them in my backpack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Felt like such a rebel. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely yeah. Well, we just said that because I'm like, we were driving into where we were staying and I'm like, babe, look at that tree. He goes, why? Well, I go, do you see all that white stuff hanging out? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah. I go, I go, that's super medicinal and bacterial. And we do not have that in Iowa. So I was like, before we leave, we have to stop somewhere and just rip some off a tree real quick and run back in the was car. Was it moss? It was the old man's beard, yeah. Oh, we had a whole bunch fantastic. of that on our um, on those trees before the hurricane. Yeah, yeah, lichen is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so is sour gum. Mm-hmm. It is. Mm. Next time we're in Tennessee, I need to get some of that. Yeah, I meant to. It's not like we won't be going up there again. <laughs> I love foraging. <laughs> right. <sighs> when I was in New York, it was my I would go camping and I'd go out hiking. I'm like my my first big one that I went into was Mullen. I was like, yes. I need, so like I'd go out and hiking and I'd like look for it. And then finally when I was hiking in the Antarctics, I found it. I'm like, yeah. and then from that point on, like I found it everywhere where I could never find it before. I was like, the minute that you find what you're looking for, it's like, you can never not find it now. Right. Cause you know what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I feel about psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the cars when you're driving by and you're like, I never see this car. And then all of a sudden you drive. And now like, same They're thing. Everywhere. Like we find it everywhere now. Yeah. yeah. We, we recently bought a, a Mercedes Sprinter van, 2,500 all wheel drive. Mm-hmm. And it's got like a Jeep community with like, you know, the Jeep wave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you guys are in a gladiator. I'm sure it's been happening. Yep. Yep. But we, we get waved at now in our van because it's got the AC. So people who are living the van life always want to wave at us and shit. It's so weird. Yeah. It's yeah. a toy hauler. Like, it is. We're not living in here. It's just hot outside. So we have an AC on the back of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The comfortability. Yeah. It is nice. They fucked up the AC though. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they were supposed to give us a free one. And then they didn't, and then they did, and it was one that was supposed to be running off of the battery or a generator in the vehicle, Mm -hmm. and they didn't give me the generator. So I was supposed to take the van back, but the guy contacted me yesterday and was like, I have a generator for you. And I'm like, okay. And I text him back. I was like, do I got to come get it? You're going to drop it off? Like, how is this going to work? And he's like, well, it's one that you just leave in the van. And I was like, okay, so are you (laughs) dropping it off, or do I have to come get it? I haven't heard back yet. (laughs) But they did install it. I have the AC installed, mm-hmm. and it's got the RV outlet, so you can plug it into a 220 and run it all night long. So in the event that we ever actually do want to sleep at, like, a campground, we can do that. And then For we, what we would spend in a campground, I think we would just get a hotel room. Uh, I mean, you can get a campground kind of cheap. Yeah? I'm not getting cheap hotel rooms. Bed bugs freak me the fuck out. Understandable. <laughs> yeah, we, we just had that conversation. Like, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm bougie. But I'm safe. Yeah. You know, like, like oh, when, I'm bougie. Yeah. When I when, when I stay he's somewhere, okay, don't fine, let him. Yeah. Don't let him fool you. He's yeah. bougie as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> we got a, like a really nice hotel here. It's sort of a hotel. Just one cute blue building. We have one room looking right out over the beach. But internet sucks. You're not too certain of like the 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 bill of health they kind of go through with all the, like their five point inspections. Like I guess this. They made will the do. listing look really nice, and then yeah. you get there and you're like, this isn't as nice as the listing was supposed yeah. to be, but it's mm-hmm. right on the beach. I'm like, I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> I can listen to listen to the ocean when I go to bed at night. That's so nice. <laughs> it is, especially being in like the middle of America to have like the ocean sounds like. Yeah, I love it. It's like the one good thing about Florida. <laughs> we have so <laughs> far as the beach. I like the beach and I like the rain. The rain's nice thunderstorms that's our big thing thunderstorm sitting out on a porch during a thunderstorm have you seen that photo where it's really like black sky with clouds and it's just like a wheat field and that's my soul that Mm -hmm. that is that is home i mean unless he's not there yeah he's where home is but Mm -hmm. good save i would like (laughs) i would like you to be there and make my soul happy we need to go to big sky country so that you can experience a real storm that would be dope Mm -hmm. because when we get storms it's just gray yeah Mm -hmm. it's just depressing gray you get a big sky country wyoming montana and you see a storm like you get giant massive circular clouds Mm -hmm. and like it's we were talking about that because 
I was sitting in a thunderstorm when I was still in New York and I'm like, oh, this is so great. I was sending him like videos of it and he goes, well, you have really good thunderstorms. I'm like, oh, they're great here. And he goes, yeah, we don't. <laughs> I'm like, aw, that's my favorite. Just sitting inside watching the thunderstorm go through and like counting the seconds between when the lightning hits and the thunder and like- you have to count the like, miles. Yeah, to be like, how far away is it? Yeah. And he's like, well, yeah, we don't have that here in Iowa. <laughs> that sucks. I, that would fuck me up a little bit. We, it's it, it's a periodic thing. We have a thing called deratios now. And if you want to see a really beautiful storm, mm -hmm. watch for the first five minutes. If you want to be safe, get the fuck out of that storm after about five minutes. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it's a land hurricane in theory. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, when you have clouds coming in from every direction, that's about the best we have now. Mm -hmm. Or snow periodically and ice. So I look mm -hmm. forward to those to those earth shattering deratios now. Yeah. So I'm going to change the conversation. So How does yes, that feel? Feels pretty good, right? Yeah. Being in control of the conversation. Yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> Just catering to that big dick ego you've got. Sitting <laughs> Thank you. I can feel the big dick energy from over here for sure. <laughs> I'll be doing dishes tonight, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you She's said like, that. No, no, the fuck you're not. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you said that, and my heart ached a little bit. Like, I know it's a joke, but don't joke like that, please. <laughs> That's my quiet time. I get to pop in an AirPod and not have to hear the kids. <laughs> Oh, they're such assholes. <laughs> they're great. We just got our kids the four wheelers. Did we talk about this yesterday? A little bit, yeah. yeah we got them four wheelers, and they're just little hellions on it. And I can't wait for that. Like yeah. when his like Mav gets older, and he mm -hmm. gets to, like do the dirt bikes and the four wheelers, and oh, I'm so excited for that. He will be one of two ways: having absolutely no fear and run straight into a fence and just keep going, or stop and go, stop and go, yeah. stop and go. That's because <laughs> we bought we have a five and a four year old. Yeah. And our son is terrified of fucking everything. Mm -hmm. Daughter Zena, warrior princess, bro. There is zero fucks. She was full throttle getting she, it around yeah. the yard. And I yeah. set the throttles the same. Like mm -hmm. she can't go more than six or seven miles an hour. But yeah. this this machine is made for a twelve year old, and she's wide the fuck open, holding it this way, can't yeah. even hit her thumb on there, and like sliding her tire and leaning into it and shit and i'm like she can hit that fence and, it's <laughs> and she did she got right back on it yeah it's crazy to me it is crazy it's neat seeing them grow up though um i cried a little bit they're not babies no more one day they're not they're gonna no mom don't hug me and i'll just fall to the ground on my knees sobbing in a public place because that's probably where they're gonna do it i'll cause a whole scene <laughs> And other moms will flock to me and will like like that scene in um, Jamestown where all the women were screaming, sobbing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to have a group cry about that. That'll be nice. Oh man, it'll help me feel a little bit better. What are you gonna change the subject to? I don't know. I'm, now I'm just forget. thinking about how therapeutic it is for women to cry together. <laughs> it is important to experience emotions with other people. Why are you looking at me like that? Uh. <laughs> neat <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i feel you because i used to be that i never would let any emotion unless it was anger i was great at anger yeah i was amazing at it anger is easy it's it is it, that's the thing it's easy everything else is hard mm -hmm. and i was i was so masculine before him i thought i was a cute little feminine butterfly who had that tough edge to her and like mm -hmm. i can be feminine i was not until i found him oh you realize those traits are real destroying. It is. And even going back through social media posts and seeing like what you posted before, like years ago when you thought you were all happy and I'm woman, hear me roar, single. I, and then you realize like it's such a defense mechanism. Yes. Such a defense mechanism. And, and it makes me cringe to think that that's who I used to be. But then it also makes me realize like how happy I am now versus where I was before that now I can sit there and be like, he can say something and I could start crying in the car and I'm like, oh, and then like before I'd be like, never would I ever let anyone see that. Even whoever I was with, like yeah. never saw me cry. Now, it could be weaponized. Oh, absolutely. It was always weaponized. They wanted that soft, but you show emotion and you cry because of something like made you sad. It was the end of the world. Now I cry because he says something and it makes me so happy that I'm like, he's like, Are you? I'm like it's happy tears, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's so nice to be able to be in that energy now where it wasn't before. Mm -hmm. So like now if we're out and we see something, even just watching TV the few times that I do and like a commercial comes on that's sad or it's a part of a movie where like before I'd only ever get emotional if like an animal got hurt. I'm like, that poor dog. And now it's that poor person. Like it changed yeah. the minute that I found him and I was able to really get into that feminine 
and just enjoy being there. So you got to experience what it was to be in your masculine so much that you got treated like dudes. Mm -hmm. Love that. Mm -hmm. Yep. How's it feel? It sucks, right? It sucks. <laughs> At the time, I thought it was amazing because I sat there and was like, I'm one of the dudes. I can sit here and, you know, dudes are way better than females. But it wasn't that they were better than females. Just, I just didn't want to tap into my emotions because they, they were hard. It was easier with all the trauma that I've been through in life to shut that down and just live off the anger because like you said, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Anger is easy, but I was also very hurt. And I hurt a lot of people because of how angry I was. And looking back at that, that hurt. And that took a lot to get over and even apologizing to people. Mm -hmm. Me and my sister didn't have a relationship up until the point I was about 25. We loathed each other growing up. When we were 25, we finally got over it after we went through therapy. And separately, we didn't even know that we were both in therapy at the time. And then we kind of both reached out when I moved back and came back to New York. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me was starting therapy. And it's hard to say that because I was always that person like, you don't need therapy. You can handle your own shit. And sometimes you just can't. And that's okay. And I'd never realized that before until that point. And now me and my sister are best friends and I wouldn't have it any other way, but it took a lot of apologizing. We still do it to this day. Almost seven, eight years later, we're like, yeah, I'm really sorry that I used to be like that. But we both knew, like we were both in really rough places and we give each other grace for that. Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing is allowing that grace to kind of set in and understand that it's not, it's not always your fault, but you still have to take responsibility because it's how you handle the situation that you're in that matters. Were you about to touch on the movie from last night when you grabbed the notepad? No, it, it was something else, but it's gone. That we, we talk all the time about how you can look at a situation and realize that you're the problem mm -hmm. and that you can take the accountability mm -hmm. in it. Even if it's not taking the blame, you can take the accountability and we get so much shit for it because it's normally in a conversation about cheating. If you were mm -hmm. cheated on, you can look at something and find an area where you might have done something differently to avoid that. Might have, right? Mm -hmm. I've never ever blamed the person that was getting cheated on for being cheated on, but that's always how it's taken on the internet because people mm -hmm. take things out of context. Um, but to be able to take accountability for things that you know that you are responsible for in a shitty scenario and not throw shade at other people is true growth. Mm -hmm. You have reached a new level of, of happiness and success in your emotional maturity when you can go, yeah, they did X, Y, and Z, but I'm not responsible for their actions. I'm only responsible for the way that I handled the situation. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's all I got. Yeah. Yep. It's freeing. I always thought it was going to be one of those things where if I did that, I was going to feel like just shitty for it. And then I never realized that like once I did that, like it just, it relieves so much stress off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a welcoming experience to be like, okay, well I handled it like shit too. Like, let me take the responsibility. You weren't the only one. It takes two to tango. Maybe I sat here and did X, Y, and Z. I thought it was coming off one way, but it really was coming off another way. And you perceived it differently than I was projecting it that I thought I was sending out. Right. And that was a big one for me and my sister both because she's at the time was very soft and very soft spoken, wore all of her emotions on her sleeve. And I was a cold hearted jackass that sat there and was like, you just need to, you know, not care so much. Like, no, you, you needed to care. I needed to soften up. And I just never saw it at the time because I was in that masculine energy. And once I started coming out of that and being like, I'm here for myself, I can start protecting myself, I can get into that, was when I realized that, okay, we, we can do this. Like, I can, I can feel those emotions and work through them and still be okay. I think one of the most attractive things about our life, our relationship, was watching that transition occur. Because, I mean, like you had said earlier, so you've been treated like a bro before. How's that feel? It's like, I mean, I've been in so many relationships with people who they carry the strength, they carry the power, but they also want to have that power struggle in the relationship. And this is the first time I watched her make these changes and these transitions and lean into her feminine and actually have happy tears and like show me those like softer, more vulnerable sides. That was one of the most attractive things I've ever experienced in a team dynamic because most people, they, they want to leave themselves with a shield of armor on. Mm -hmm. And that comes with trying to carry both roles. And then all they want to be is combative through the process of. And so in, in my experience of being in relationships, I'm more of an idea than a person. So I've done the same thing. I lean really heavy into that. People want to be around me because of my job title or because of what I can provide. So I'm just an idea. The minute me as a person comes into the picture, then all of a sudden that's like, Ugh, that's, not, that's, that's not what I was looking for. But she's the first person I can say with certainty who saw me as a person who could utilize her feminine energy, strength, whatever you want to call it, 
to help impact me to realize I'm still a person. I'm not just an idea. And that was the most calming, relieving, most like, I guess, emotionally like comforting thing I had ever been through. She says that she words it differently, but she says that Yeah. she says that she has a hard time remembering sometimes that people can perceive her outside of her head. Yeah. You worded it differently, but it's, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's wild to me. There's a safety in that. Yeah. And what you guys have, because if you didn't feel safe with him, you wouldn't be able to do that. And we have that. I'm going to talk about the movie. <laughs> okay. We, have you ever watched What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams? No, no. but I know I, I know the movie. It's a crime movie for me. Yeah. There's a couple movies that I will watch and I will sob. And I, I can cry a lot on my own when nobody's there to see it. Mm -hmm. And when she's there, I have to like, you know, I'm not going to ugly cry. And then we watched it and got to the end of it last night. And she's sitting over there with the, the blanket over her Catching face. Catching my tears. Sobbing. <laughs> it's ugly. Like, this should be illegal. Like. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, they should put a warning label on movies like this. But she's able to do that and not feel guilty about it. Yeah. Because she knows there's no judgment there, you know. So I would never try to watch movies like that around a woman before because yeah. I, I will ugly cry over really? shit like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't. There's there's certain times like obviously depending on what my hormones are doing, like if, if my my hormones weren't in check and we watched that movie last night, it had been ugly. I had an ugly cry. We could have held I'm each other. <laughs> I imagine I'm an ugly crier. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. with, with, with the beer <laughs> like that. I, I, I don't know where it would go. I imagine to be that direction, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My thing is I'm afraid to open the flood dams. Yeah. If I don't suppress it and it actually starts to come out, it's game over. Yeah. I think so. you'd feel so much better after doing that, though. I feel better now. Feel good. So, so tell me this. Like, when you really started leaning into being able to, like, express your emotions, did you have these overwhelming feelings of them that were just uncontrollable? Like, you really started to understand who you were. You could express your emotions with another person. So in really inconvenient or... Um, in uh, unpredicted times, did you just kind of feel this full body, like emotional experience that you hadn't had before because you'd bottled it up so much? Are you asking me or her? Just in general. Yes. Um, that when I refound my faith is when that happened. Yeah. Um, I had harbored and, and like harnessed so much that in finding my faith again, I, I had a, I had about three months where I would cry about everything. It yeah. was it was so stupid. Every Sunday service, I cry. We're, and it's. It's it's awkward at first. Yeah. Like I try to fight it so hard because at the start of our service we have all the music going on right. and we have live music and our church is amazing when it comes to the music that they play. And there's always one song. Doesn't matter what we get, there's always one that like I listen to and like he said, you get that whole body just tingles going through it and I just start sobbing. And it's not a sad sob, like before everything, like whenever anyone cry, I always thought like, Oh, you're just sad. Like, no, it's it's a feeling of strength and love and comfort that it's almost like what I get from him, that safety of being there, which coming from my past religious like followings like was awkward. Yeah. But then the first time I did it, like he looked over, we're standing there like swaying to the music and really enjoying it. And he looked over and saw me crying and immediately just wiped, wiped the tears away. And it made me cry even more because he just held me and kissed me and allowed me to just cry through the song without judgment, without like, why the hell are you crying? Which I would have gotten in any other relationship I've ever been in. So just to sit there and be able to do that while in a place that I never thought I would be in my life, never thought I'd be following, you know, any type of church or let alone be in a church. Right. And to be in there and enjoy it and feel those emotions and be able to process through them with someone it's amazing. It's life changing. It I really like is. Person. I like that you're that person. Because <laughs> we never thought, I mean, either one of us never thought we'd be in a church. Yeah. Ever. Like, and now we go, we, we look forward to it. It's like our recharge time. Mm -hmm. And I never understood that when people used to say that before. Oh, we go to church and it's like a, a reset for the week. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And now we, I get it. You guys watch The Chosen? Mm mm. That, that we, we both cry when The Chosen comes on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We actually, we've been talking a lot lately to take that time. We have Sundays now, mm -hmm. no work. I'm not on the tablet or on the computer because we don't really have really solid us time. Now, whether that's mm -hmm. with, with a movie, we're just sitting down and like maybe binging a show a little bit or just like doing something, me helping her cook dinner, if she'll allow me to do so and make things harder on her. <laughs> it, like it's, it's required to do those things, to actually enjoy those experiences, those emotions that we can have together. We mm -hmm. still don't really have a lot of open availability to do so. That's the reason we wake up early is mm -hmm. our office time together is, is us time. Right before bed, that's us time. But mm -hmm. 
that full day to just lean into that, the roles that each other have, our strong suits, the things that we can help each other with is so important, which is why Sunday is going to church finally mm -hmm. is such a beautiful experience because I've never had those feelings. I'm, I'm on a war path every single day of my life. Everything that I do is a battleground. And so to be able to come home, have that peace, know that I can kind of take the armor off and have her power to just kind of soothe all of that and be in that together, I've never known that. So it's still very uncomfortable, but in a very comforting way. When you're used to chaos, something new is very strange. Mm -hmm. It's unsettling at first yeah. because you're waiting. Because from the past, you're waiting for history to repeat itself. You're waiting for that other shoe to drop and you have to stop and sit there and remind yourself, Sometimes it just doesn't drop. Like, it's okay. You've worked hard for the relationship that you have. You guys have built that solid foundation. And from that foundation is where that safety comes into play. So in coming out of your masculine and being the supportive wife role, how is that, how is that going for you? Amazing. Yeah. I love it. I've gotten a lot of slack for it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of judgment for it because I left everything I had in New York my businesses, my career, it wasn't just a job, I, I was on a career path with it, to come and take care of him. I left all my responsibilities behind and now my responsibilities are him. I left my income, now that falls on him. He pays my insurances, my car payment, he pays the mortgage. I don't have to worry about any of that and I know he'll figure it out. I don't have to ask him, hey, what's in the account? That's that's what he does. And that's that alone is such a nice feeling to not have to worry about it. it was tough at first because I'm like I'm so used to taking care of it for 32 years of my life I had to support me no matter what relationship no matter what marriage I was in I was the one having to do it all and now just being able to be in that feminine and take care of the home take care of him it is just it's mind altering mm -hmm. to a degree too but it's also it was hard at first because of the judgments that I got onto it I lost friendships because of it because they saw it before the friendships were being able to talk shit about the relationships. Everyone was so unhappy that that's just all you talked about in the minute that you started talking about being happy and having a safe place to rely on and being able to be your feminine. It was hard because a lot of friends just didn't understand. You're brainwashed. You know, he's going to change the minute you get down there. This isn't what you want. You don't know what you want. I'm like, you guys don't understand. Like, we've spent months building what we have. Mm -hmm months. We have a solid foundation. We talked about things that you've never even talked about in your relationship and you've been married for five, six, seven years. We already have those things figured out. And to be able to rely on that is nice because I never had that before. It's nice to be able to sit there and say, hey, if a problem comes up, we're going to be able to work through it from start to finish and not have to worry about it being weaponized mm -hmm. or being able to actually understand and communicate to understand, not just communicate to talk back and forth to each other, but truly understand which each side of that person is thinking, where they're coming from, and why they're coming from that point. Did everyone, well, it sounds like friends and family, mm -hmm. kind of really question your decision-making and starting this relationship? Did it ever make you second-guess yourself or what you wanted? No. For the first time in my life, I can say that being in my feminine and knowing that he was that safe place for me, they didn't see that. So I understand where their concerns came from. You're moving halfway across the country to someone that you've known less than a year and you're leaving everything you worked for behind. The biggest thing that my family had a problem with was, well, you're leaving your career. That's a career, you, you have a state job, why would you leave that? Okay, but I have a state job, but it's never always certain. Mm -hmm. Like if they came back through and did another COVID vaccine thing, I, I would have left. I would have figured it out. I would have left because it wasn't something that I was willing to do. So that job certainty to me is never certain. You can always change that. But they were very harsh on judgments. I still right now have family members that don't really talk to me because I left the state Yeah, and they're not happy for me. They'll get over it. Or they won't. And that's OK, too. It's not my I've gotten to the point in my life now where I can love you. I can appreciate you but you don't have to be a part of my life either mm -hmm. and that for me was hard for a very long time to get over because I was brought up to where family's family no matter what you stick through with them that's not always the case if people in my life aren't going to be supportive I can love you doesn't mean you have to be a part of my life mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that at this point in my life where I wasn't before where I allowed crappy situations to happen and allowed you know 
a lot of negative things in my life because, well, that's blood. That's just what you do. And you don't have to. On one of our podcast episodes, I said that I love unconditionally, but there's conditions to be in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Your life changes when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that that is, it's just simple boundary setting. Mm -hmm. You can be who you are and I'll love you for that. I'm just not going to have you around me or my kids. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. We had a conversation not long ago about what unconditional love is now in comparison to when people truly loved with like with their whole hearts. Mm -hmm. And I I believe unconditional love in today's day and age is just complacency. Like I will love you unconditionally no matter what I do. Right. You know what I mean? But the reality is like there's always conditions. We we always joke that like we're on a month by month because we're always checking in with each Mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that dues are paid. We want to make sure that we are hitting each other's benchmarks consistently. Mm -hmm which then without statement becomes unconditional love because we know we're always checking in. I've been in relationships where it was like, I love you unconditionally except for all of these variables or because we're just really comfortable and we don't want to have to change the dynamic because we both continuously just grow further apart, but we're very comfortable in where we are. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I I love that. Like I will love you unconditionally, but there are conditions. Mm -hmm. And so with her and I, that, that month to month relationship, Mm -hmm. Uh, navigational system just means frequently we're checking in with each other. What can I do better? Mm-hmm. How can we make this stronger so we're not growing further apart? Because you go through these these systems where you completely just kind of, you let enough go. You let enough slide. All of a sudden, you don't really know who you are in this relationship anyway. So you just become two shadows living in the same comfortable, like, burning ecosystem. I've been there. I've created that in relationships. So because I was so uncertain in who I was, what I was looking for, anything would would slide because I didn't know who I was. How the hell was I supposed to know I love this person? So it just seemed comfortable because then that defines me. Now I can attach myself to the relationship title as opposed to truly knowing that these two people are supposed to work together in that ecosystem. We've now built our own like strength or our own demise. Mm. And fuck me if this isn't like the most... This is the one thing I always called myself Indiana Jones of human emotion because I didn't believe in any of it, but I was always on the never ending pursuit to find it. And how rewarding is it to finally come across that one thing and to realize there is no definition because it's something you're always pursuing. I'd put up yesterday is uh, success a destination or is it a measurement? I believe happiness is a measurement. I believe love is a measurement because you're always kind of trying to see how far it can go because you can't live today's love or you can't live yesterday's love today without some sort of consistent pursuit. And so I think people just get complacent in the love they first experienced or the obsession or the lust or whatever it may be. And that goes back to the fuck first, ask questions later mentality that most relationships are. We created a colonial love, like you had said, courting, Mm -hmm. where we really got to know each other on a personal level first. And now we don't have to chase what we've imagined it is. We just have to continuously rewrite what we would like it to continuously become because it changes it's never always the same some weeks i need you know more support than other weeks and if i don't check in and let him know that he's not going to know that and i think that's in the past where i suffered a lot is that i never was okay with telling someone hey i need you a little bit more this week emotionally than i did last week where here I can be like, hey, I'm feeling a little off today. Like, can can you love me a little bit more today? And he can be like, okay, I can't expect him to just know that. He's not a mind reader. And I think that's where I failed a lot in the past is that I expected people to just know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can't, you have to be able to speak up and say, this is what I need. I need you to step up for me this week. And then the next week, maybe he needs me to step up for him. It's just that constant flow back and forth, but that communication and understanding is huge. Mm-hmm. So you said before you moved, your friends were telling you that he was brainwashing you. Mm -hmm. Were they thinking that he was manipulating you in some sort of way? Yeah. Elaborate on that for me. Um, So there was one friend that I had and I was telling her about stuff. And she's like, well, that sounds all good and dandy, but like, that's not going to be how it is. You're going to get down there and he's just going to change. That's how every relationship is. I was like, no, that's how every relationship you had is. Mm -hmm. You're not going to know unless you go through with it. Why would I sit there and say, well, what if? What if, okay, what if it does happen? Guess what? I'll figure it out. I figured out my past situations. I'm going to figure out these current situations. It'll be okay. I've got me at the end of the day, but right now I don't have to because he has me. Mm -hmm. And we've built on that and we know that. And we both know that this is what we want. This is where we're going. 
and we talk about it constantly. They never had that communication with their partners to know that that is an option. And it got to the point where I can remember one conversation directly where we were talking about vehicles, as silly as that is. And they had just gotten a new vehicle and they left. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, we're talking about, you know, down the road getting a Wagoneer because when we have kids, like we want to be able to have kids and enjoy what we have and have that space for them. We don't want them crammed in the back of like the vehicles we have now. And it was such such a sad moment because it was, well, you don't need that size of vehicle. You just can get my vehicle. My vehicle would be plenty for what you need. I'm like, well, no, this we want the way this is what we want. Like we've talked about it. We'll get there. Well, that's just that's not needed. Well, it's not maybe needed for you, but it would be for us. Like, why is that? And I even said, I was like, why is that a problem? And I think it was more of that jealousy side of it. Well, I don't have that. So why do you need to have that? And that's where a lot of the friends came into play with that was I was moving up. Mm -hmm. I was getting a relationship that they wish they always had, but they never put the work in for. We worked on it. We put that work in. We built that foundation And it's sad to see that. And I get it because I used to be that person. Mm -hmm. I used to be that jealous person that would be mean about it. Well, I don't have this. Why do you need it? So I understood where they were coming from. And I did take it personally at first when I told them, like, hey, guys, I'm going to be moving. And they all got really mad at me. And I never I never understood why until I stepped back and kind of analyzed and went, "Okay, well, I get it because none of you want to be in the state. None of you want to be at your jobs. I'm doing what you were always afraid to do. Or I'm doing what you're afraid would ever happen to you in a situation where you weren't stepping enough up to the plate and your partner left you. I can't help you on that. You got to work through that. And even sitting there saying that, it was probably after I moved two months before any of my friends reached out and contacted me, even with me reaching out to them saying, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. A lot of messages were left unread. And it hurt at first. And then I realized... Okay, well, if you were really my friend, you would have responded back. You would have cared enough to even check on me. If you were so afraid that he was brainwashing me, why didn't you check in with me? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you see if I was okay? The phone works both ways. The internet works both ways. When I check in on you and you don't say anything back, you show me where I belong in your life. Yeah. I love you. I love the relationship that we had. But moving forward, I I still love you. But Mm -hmm. we're probably never going to have what we had before because I'm not willing to stay in that negative space with you. That's the strangest thing to me. I had somebody causing turmoil reaching out to people because they they believe that my husband's abusing me. And I reached out to them. I called this person three times and all three times they sent me to voicemail. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, thank God my husband's not actually beating me because if he was and this is me reaching out to you, I'd be fucked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just blows my mind how people can feign a worry for you with ulterior motives behind it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that they're not your friends anymore. (laughs) Honestly, I am too. Like, you're going to get so much further in life. Your mentality, your, not your mentality, but your mental state's not going to suffer anymore. The people who you surround yourself with are supposed to be excited for you. Mm-hmm. If I had one of my friends come to me today and go, I'm moving here to be with X, Y, and Z, I'd be like, dope, you need to let me know how it goes. Like, I'm going to pray for you. I hope mm-hmm. it works out well, and I hope you find the happiness that you want. Out of the handful of friends that I had, I have two left. I two. believe that. And they still check, even as busy as they are in their life, they were both going through police academies. They still checked in during all of that. Like they were from sunup to sundown busy. They both have multiple kids and they still checked in. And they even like, it was funny because they even apologized for it. They're like, I'm sorry, I haven't reached out before. Now we've, don't be sorry. Mm -hmm. We'll catch up when we catch up. You care. And that to me, we could go six months without talking and then we talk again totally okay Mm -hmm. because I know that you care you're just busy with your life I'm busy with mine and that's fine we don't have to have that communication every day but knowing that you care is what matters yes humans shouldn't be having communications every day we're not built for that before email even became a thing we were sending letters Mm -hmm. and that would take what three to five business days Mm -hmm. and then back in like the 1920s you wouldn't see something for three months right this unlimited access has given so many people this entitlement and like a permanent place in other people's lives, it's. I had to step back from it because the minute I would get a text, I would have to answer. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you don't need that answer right away. Yeah, It's not that important. Why am I stressing my life out to reply right then and there mm-hmm. when it's just a simple question? 
Like you'll get the answer when you get it. And I, I struggled hard with that for a while, especially because of my previous job. Like we were the minute something happened, you had to take care of it. Mm-hmm. That carried over into my life. Now I'm able to just step back and be like, OK, I, I saw your message. I'll get back to you. Yeah. When that anxiety, because I used to have that anxiety, mm-hmm. too, like I was glued to my phone because if I missed a message, I would get bitched at for it. Mm-hmm. It was a problem. Mm-hmm. Yes. There is like you're at somebody's beck and call at that point. There, there is no free will because you are restrained by somebody else's emotions. Mm-hmm. That, that step back is a really big deal. I don't have Facebook. I deleted my Facebook. I have an Instagram that I post my photos to every once in a while. And then I have TikTok, which is like a daily reminder if I actually have to go on there and post something. Mm. The TikTok is a job, though. It is a job. Yeah. It's the only reason I have it. <laughs> so in everything that you've experienced... Would you go through all of it again to have what you have now? Absolutely. I would go through it 10 times over and make it 10 times harder Mm -hmm. to get to where I am right now. Right now in my life is the best I've ever had. I'm safe. I'm secure. I feel like I belong somewhere. I am appreciated. Never have I been appreciated for who I was. Mm -hmm. I was always too loud, too opinionated. There's no way you were too loud. (laughs) (laughs) Too loud. I was that person that if we were out somewhere and I saw something I didn't like, like I made it known. Oh, okay. I did not like that. And I was not quiet about it. Since being with Mike, I'm very much more in my feminine and quiet <laughs> to the point that like he has to tell me, I can't hear you. You need to speak up. We'll be in the gym. We share headphones when we're in the gym because we like to listen to the same thing when we're working out. And I think he can hear me and I think I'm talking at a normal volume, but apparently I'm whispering. (laughs) So we work on that a lot now where I'm like, I have to speak up now where before like, I was so loud. Yeah, I was obnoxious. I was that obnoxious person that like now if I saw me Mm -hmm. five years ago, I'd be like, what is her problem? (laughs) Yeah, I I get that. I used to be 340 pounds. I was an alcoholic. (laughs) And even though I was insecure, I was on that body positivity train, so I had to make sure that everybody else thought that I thought that I was sexy. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you said that you would, like, you've looked at old photos of you, and you're like, oh, gosh. When we were in Vegas on vacation, I think he was in the room taking a nap, and I was sitting out on a balcony, and I went through, and I deleted almost 8,000 photos of myself from years ago. I'm talking like maybe 10 years. And all of them are like, I'm trying to show skin and I have my st- my tongue sticking out and I've done my makeup really fucking loud. And there was a lot of shame in seeing all of that because I was doing it for the attention and validation of others, mm-hmm. not because I felt good about myself. And in that moment when I was that person, all I could think about was I'm getting attention. Doesn't matter if it's good or bad. People are validating me that I'm, I'm here. Mm-hmm. Now, with the mindset that I have, looking back on that, I was like, I can't believe people remember me like that. It's, it makes my bones feel like I need to clean them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A good bleach dip just to come back out shiny. But looking back at that journey and like, I was fuck all men. I am a proud, independent woman. I made it known that I was paying my own rent and I didn't have somebody there for me. Hearing that back, I'm like, oh, what a sad life. It truly is. It really is. And it's it's really strange to believe that you can live in that mindset of fuck all men while simultaneously wanting to be in a relationship with a man. Mm-hmm. It, it never works. It, it never doesn't works. work. And you think it works in the moment. And then you look when you finally find someone mm-hmm. who allows you to be you. Yeah. You don't have to mask. I masked in every relationship I was ever in because, again, I was always too much of something. Mm-hmm. So for me, I always figured out with that person, okay, well, who do you want me to be? And I became that person. I was never myself. In my current relationship with Mike, I can be me. I can sit and go, hey, I think I want to try this. And he's so supportive. It doesn't matter. It could be something with my hair. It could be, this is the style of tattoos I want before people would be like, that's stupid. Don't get that. Or why are you going to do that? Like, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Him, he's like, Hell yeah, run it. Let's let's see it. Yeah. And that is just so freeing. But to look back and see, like you said, the pictures that even you posted is so cringy to see that I used to be that person that, you know, I used to be 250 pounds. I lost Mm -hmm. 125 pounds. And to see the quality of photos that I posted before and even just the titles that I would put under my photos, I was like, 
I was you. so hurt back then that yeah. like I just projected and I see it now with people. I'm like, oh, poor thing. You poor like, but people look at me and think poor thing to me because I'll sit there and post. I love being home. I love taking care of my house. I love making sure that his breakfast is cooked and on the table, that his coffee is ready in the morning. Like those things I, I enjoy doing. They fill my cup. Where before I would have been like, why are you doing that? That's right. that's disgusting. You're like, serving a man. Right. Like, yeah, now it's, I get to serve you. Like, mm-hmm. that's an honor to me that I get to sit here and make sure that everything that he has is in line and ready to, he doesn't have to worry about anything besides going to work and coming home. Yeah. You know what I do sometimes? I'll sit there and I'll look at him and be like, out of every single woman, everyone, this bitch, stop. <laughs> <laughs> we do that almost. Yep. Almost daily, I still do that. Like I'll just, we'll be driving, and I'll just be looking at him, mm-hmm. and he'll be like, "What are you looking at?" I'm like, you, I'm just so, I'm lucky. I get that. Like, mm-hmm. and it's funny because I sit there and go, most people wonder what it would be like to have their dream life. I don't just have my dream life. I have my dream person. Mm-hmm. I found my end. I found what makes me happy, and it's not just within me, but it's within him. Like it's that unity together that just. Once it blends, you mm-hmm. don't realize what you're missing until you find it. Your perspective on everything changes when that happens, too. One of our most viral TikToks was a, a, an a email being read where she paused and she's like, imagine having your perfect person. And I was like, I don't have to. And she's like, oh, and she started crying. And then she started talking again. And I was like, I said, I don't have to. That's right? not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at him and it took me a minute to process what he just said to me. And I was like, oh, I'm his dream person. And I started smirking and like, I'm just sitting there and he's like, what? And I was like, I don't know. My sternum's itchy. Like I have to oh, that's self-soothe. That came from. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I thanked God in that moment. That, that, that says a lot. I want to go back because I'll forget. And I have something I want to talk about at the end, but I don't want to be too involved in all of this. You had made a comment about how you get to serve him and that's, that fills your cup. Um, being on the opposite side of that, like when we go to Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner with our family, she serves my plates in front of everyone. And like, I don't have to get up and go into the kitchen. I will sit down at the table and wait and she will bring me my food and then go get her plate. And I will sit there and I will wait for her to sit down. We're not, nobody's eating until we pray anyways, but my plate is on the table before everyone else's because she gets it. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's the biggest flex for me. And people are like, oh, you're an adult. You can't get your own plate. I absolutely can. I don't have to mm-hmm. like, so yeah, I can. And I, I can even cook, think about feeding, but your I don't fucking have to. Yeah. So be salty. <laughs> I, I don't care. I, I'm fucking happy. She's happy. Like. Mind your business, but to be on the receiving end of that is huge. But yeah, we do the same thing. Like wherever we're at eating wise, like I'll get his plate first, make sure he's all set, then I'll grab mine and come down and sit down. But it's it's a give and take. I don't ever have to touch a door handle. Ever. Not a vehicle, not a house, not a building. I don't touch those like to the point now that if I'm out somewhere and I see someone coming through, I'll wait for that person to walk through because I'm not touching that door handle. Because I'm so used to it now with him that like that is such a feminine thing that people don't realize that like you don't have to do that if you wait like people will open the door for you mm-hmm. but to have him do that for me makes your heart melt it does it absolutely does and it was funny because that was one of the things that we talked about before like we ever got into a relationship we talked about things that we wanted within different relationships and that we never got and they just aligned so well same thing when we're we're out in town walking Mm -hmm. i'm never walking on the side of the street and if i accidentally do it's immediately he grabs me and pulls me into where i need to be he's like no you're on this side you're not on the roadside like what are you doing Mm -hmm. like i know i'm silly my bad (laughs) (laughs) but it's just so refreshing to have that Mm -hmm. it is i feel pampered yes like stop (laughs) so I started working when I was like 16 or 17 Mm -hmm. years old. By the time I was 18, I moved out. I moved in with a boyfriend who was still living at his parents' house. And I was the only one working. (laughs) I mean, his parents worked, but out of our relationship, (laughs) I was the only one working. And I was doing, I was a merchandiser for a massive company. So I was the only female on my team. And I think out of that whole distribution center, I was like maybe one of four females that worked. And it was a lot of heavy lifting. I was up four o'clock in the morning, had to be at my first Walmart by like 4.45 in the morning. And during the holiday season, I wasn't home until nine or 10 o'clock at night, rinse and repeat the next day. Mm My my body went through it and I would like it got to the point to where my hands would get super dirty and calloused and like I was full fledged like I was already in my masculine at that point. But 
looking at my body and not seeing a feminine creature, just I fur- further extended that. And now my husband opened my door for me. What do you mean you're going to draw me a bath? <laughs> you you want to hold my feet and rub my feet while we're watching a movie? Okay. Mm-hmm. That that it's like you can feel that armor being shed off of you. And it's piece by piece and like the lightness afterwards. Even just our drive from New York to Iowa when I moved, we stopped to get gas. Immediately I opened my door and go, why are you touching your door? I'm like, because I'm going to go pump the gas. Like I'm, I'm driving. I'm gonna... He goes, no, you're not. Close your door. Got out, pumped the gas, went inside, got his drinks. I didn't have to worry. And like him while he was pumping, I, like, I t- took a picture. I'm like, I'm going to remember this moment for the rest of my life. All of that is our life. Mm-hmm. I didn't take a picture, but the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. I was sitting in the passenger front driver's seat. This is probably the only time we've ever done this where I drove, and this was during our courting phase. I pulled up to the gas pump. He's like, don't get out the car. I'm going to pump your gas. And I was like, you're going to what? Like, I I was that that woman who would get out while my man's sitting in the passenger seat fucking around on his phone, and I'm standing out there in the freezing cold or in the rain pumping my gas. And now you don't have to. I think that is the biggest ho shit. When men sit in the car while their women pump gas, it mm-hmm. oh, irritates yeah. the fuck out of me. It dude. does to me now, too. I, I look at him like, oh, you poor thing. Right. <laughs> like, here I am in a nice warm car and he's out there doing it all and I don't ever have to worry about it. I mean, mm-hmm. very few times do I ever drive. Like, if I'm, it's because I want to, mm-hmm. but I never have to do anything else besides get us from point A to point B. Yeah. But it's because I enjoy driving. But if, I mean, 99% of the time, I'm never driving. And it's such a different experience because I used to hate when people drove me. Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't be in the passenger seat. Couldn't do it. Like, my anxiety would go through the roof having someone else in control of a vehicle that something could happen with. Him, he's the first person that I trust. Like, I don't worry about it. Like, I can be on my phone. I can never be on my phone in a passenger seat before mm-hmm. him. Now, I could read. I could play on my phone. I mean, half the time I'm staring at him instead. <laughs> But, like, I'm not worried about what's around us because I know he has us covered. Mm -hmm. He knows who's on the side of us, who's in front, who's behind. He's paying attention to what's going on. Same thing when we go out to eat. I sit where he can see the front door and who's coming in. Like, I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Where before, I'd walk into a a restaurant, a building, and I'd immediately map out every exit, know where things are. I'm still vigilant to know if, like, something happened, we could get out. Mm -hmm. But I'm not constantly on edge. I'm more watching him while still paying attention, but my attention's on him more than it is on anything else because I know he has it covered. Right. I love that. It, it's so nice. I, you said that majority of the time in the car, you're just looking at him. Mm-hmm. There are times that he's catching me. Like, oh, there, like the sun sets there and there's this really soft glow mm-hmm. through the windshield. His nose is probably one of my favorite features on his face. <laughs> Oh. Which is funny because it's been broken. My septum's all fucked up. <laughs> I was going to say, it's got a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've never been attracted to noses before. Mm-hmm. His side profile just fucking does it for me. And like when he's really stoic and he's driving, he's got one hand on the wheel and he's got his hand like this and he's like really pondering. I'm like, yeah, you fucking think, babe. <laughs> Whatever you got for him and laid in there, I'm going to hear about it later. I'm uh-huh. so excited. And then <laughs> I, I love doting over my husband. It's one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> What, have you ever watched I'm gonna talk about you guys like you're not here have you ever watched him open a door and like you pay attention to that lat as when we're in the gym mm-hmm. like a stingray oh yeah like the minute that he starts like moving like I'm sitting there with my camera like getting in on those angles I'm like <laughs> I'm gonna watch this later yeah I love that it. one trip when you're gone this is mm-hmm. gonna keep me company mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> how long was your courting face we went probably about six months yeah about six months yeah. and, and that's what we call the colonial stage mm-hmm. because she was in new york i was in iowa i was going through a lot she was going through a lot mm-hmm. but at first it just started with we, we just talked art we just talked business we truly got to know each other where our strong suits were we got to mm-hmm. know each other's backstories where we were where we hoped to be and like we were saying yesterday there was a lot of the um, how things were but only to positively impact mm-hmm. how things can be to know each other's triggers to know how to be able to navigate through stuff like that but it was colonial because we were writing each other letters she was right. sending me like lipstick prints on on notes all the time and he still um, has the letters that i sent him because i would his the address labels i would like do paintings or drawings or and he still he's like you're writing to me yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask very tearfully until the inmate comment. How was that for you? <laughs> it was so refreshing because it was funny because we would never know. Like we would be like, I'm going to surprise him with a letter. And then it would it planned. It had to be some 
godly intervention because we would end up getting packages on the same day not knowing that we were sending them oh, out wow. and then we'd end up being like hey go go check your mailbox I'd be like what do you mean go check He's like, go check your mail because i wouldn't check my mailbox I'm like who who gets yeah. mail now mm-hmm. and i'm like oh the first time i'm like okay and i like walked out suspicious i'm like why am i checking he goes just go check i'm like okay i got, I got this <laughs> and like there was a package there and i'm like and then it would be a letter, it would, be, it would always be something. And then just the fact that it always lined up when we didn't plan on it. Like, I was like, oh, this is, this is it. Mm-hmm. Like, the fact that we're both thinking about each other when neither one of us told, and then we would find that, like, and then to, like, come down and know that he saved everything that I gave him, like. <sighs> Butterflies. How was it for you receiving letters? I felt like the prettiest inmate at the ball. <laughs> 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 no, and it, it, it was that because there was there's this weird anxiety that I felt just wanting to get to that next stage, that mm-hmm. next experience where it could go from letters to like that true interaction. Um, but I I looked forward to them every day, you know, whether she was sending them to the house or the shop. I knew that around the corner there'd be something there to slowly like create more of an adhesive to what it was we were trying to build. Because again, every relationship I'd been in, it was in such a rush where this was, this was patience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it required so much patience to know that there was something around the corner, didn't know when, didn't know what, but we had our connectability, we had Mm -hmm. our connection, but there was always something to look forward to that wasn't going to be just immediate gratification. Our relationship didn't revolve around the physical aspects where we could just give each other this, this little quick climax, then like, call me when you're bored. You know what I mean? And that's, in, in, in my previous life as like a musician, tattoo artist, you're just people using people, you know what yep. I mean? Just to kind of get you to that next step, just to kind of help you get by a little bit. It was a quick fix, but then you always felt a little bit more empty instead of a little bit more fulfilled. Now, if I had to wait three days, if I had to wait a week for another letter, there was no depletion. Going back to the conversation from yesterday, everything was so fulfilling knowing that I had to work on my patience because I was a very impatient person. Still am in a lot of aspects. So but with this, it is such a gradual, slow moving, like solidified foundation that I cannot wait to see where it goes, but I'm so patient being able to experience each and every moment. So from where it was to the letters to where it is with what every day is, these whether we have a deep dive conversation and we can actually come to either a resolution or at least really come to a conclusion of seeing each other's perspectives, or if it was the letters, it's it's the same gratification mm-hmm. that you get. And I don't have to worry about who I'm gonna call at 2 a.m. because I'm bored to tears, you know right. what I mean? Now I get to go home to the person who just fills my cup in every aspect every single night. I get to wake up to her every single night and I know there's always going to be something cute that we do that I never would have appreciated in my, in my <laughs> previous lives. It's like me being the the masculine alpha. Like now I feel inside like she projects outside when she does this and then gets all cute and like starts talking a little bit more high pitch. That's how I feel inside, yeah. but I'm still bearded and tattooed. I don't know how to do that pitch. So just know that I feel it. And it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. We are courting phase. I don't want I want to, I always tell people it lasted a year. It, it didn't start that way. Mm-hmm. It started as her, my, she was my therapist mm-hmm. because I was going through a divorce, dude. I was fucking suicidal. Like I was in a really dark place mm-hmm. and I didn't have any friends that were neutral. Because everyone knew my wife. Yeah. She was neutral ground and I could, I had somebody to talk to. And because of the conversations that were had, that foundation started getting built, like you said, because you were having conversations about previous experiences and how you wanted things to be. Mm -hmm. And that was how we created our list of boundaries, expectations of what we want from a person. You know, we, we, we spent a year of in-depth conversations that was not sexually intimate. It was spiritually intimate like we built a real foundation and i have a connection with her that i've never had with another human being like there's times where we're thinking about the same shit Mm -hmm. and there's no conversation i'm like hey and she'll be like blah 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 blah. and i was like get the fuck out of my head (laughs) and it's not prompted yeah we could be driving somewhere and have a conversation and my mind will go to something else and hers will follow it's fucking eerie it is very eerie but there's a, a comfort and a security in that foundation that i don't have to worry about shit either there's there's something to be said about taking things slow yeah you know well it builds that foundation to the point that i don't have to worry like if we ever did get into like a real heated argument that i know we're not going to leave each other over it that i know that we're going to work through it because we've had those conversations we know okay i may be heated i may be emotional right now 
But I know how at the end of the day how this ends and it ends with us together. Yep. Whether we're upset with each other or not, doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's still you, it's still me, and it's still us. Did either one of you ever deal with abandonment issues? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something I talk pretty heavily on with the <laughs> coaching that I do is what makes me good at knowing to be able to see things in hindsight, like in real time is because of the abandonment issues I've, I've always had. I'm adopted. So no matter what my family dynamic was, I was still the outsider looking in, you know, if it was, if I always had to meet someone else's expectations. So I was never quite good enough. I got really good at manipulating when I was a kid, but it was because I, I just wanted to be accepted. I just wanted people to like me. That's how I got into the party scene and how I did everything was I, I, I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted people to like me, but I was a chameleon in those things. So I never really knew who I was, but as time went on, it really solidified where my boundaries were, but I could still, I, I was manipulative. Yeah. I was a narcissist. I was an internally, I was a shitty person, but I knew there was something better. I didn't realize that I needed to drop all of my, all of my borders. I needed to drop all my bullshit, tear down all my walls. I had to tear up my script. And finally just kind of give in because I wasn't as strong and as tough as I thought I was. Yeah. So you're saying you were the problem? I was definitely the problem. <laughs> it was, it, it, I mean, going back, it was really easy to like say every external situation that was dealt my direction was what made me who I was. So I was always the, um, I was always a product of my environment. I was never right. a student of my process. And just having that saying in my head at all times makes me realize that everything was a learning experience. I was the problem. Right. I was also the one being educated. I was also I was the teacher. I was the student. And now I can apply that to my life. I bring that up because I have borderline personality disorder and so does she. And abandonment was always one of my big things. She could have an off morning and it would trigger that abandonment. Mm -hmm. in me. But because of the way we communicate, even when we have disruptions now, the abandonment's not there. I know she's not leaving. Yeah. Like I'm not worried about it. I don't have to be like, you're not gonna leave, are you? Like that's I don't that's not a thing for me anymore. And it's the first time ever in my life that I've experienced that because when you have abandonment issues and, and that gets triggered, your response is to be like, I'm gonna push them away before they leave me. Yep. So that I I'm the one causing this. And that's not a thing anymore either. Mm -hmm. There is there is a lot that to be said in the way that your foundation works out and the way that you're able to communicate can completely change your perspective on everything. I got nothing. I have a whole conversation at the end of this. It's one thirty. How much yeah, how much longer do you wanna go? You want to run? It's one thirty. You want to yeah. run? Okay. Um, we talked about the past and how much change has been handled. Uh, I'm sorry, has been had, and we can fall off. Uh, we can like fall off the planet, right? From all of our social groups, do a whole lot of, of work on ourselves, shadow work, whatever you want to call it, and pop up six months later, reignite conversations and friendships, mm -hmm. and you have come out of a cocoon. You are a completely different person, and it changes your perspective on other people. Mm -hmm. So while other people are still holding on to this. Um, image of who you were six months ago or six years ago, you have evolved, right? How, how has that affected you guys? Because you, you changed 100%. How long did that take? For a complete change? Yeah. Probably it took about four or five months before I finally just was like, okay, this is it. Cause I had those, it was the ban abandonment issue. Right. It was like, I was terrified. Like we're thousands of miles, literally 999 miles apart from his house to mine before. And I was always afraid, like, okay, well, it's going to fall through. It's going to fall through. He's going to leave. Like, there's going to be something that just he doesn't like about me and it's going to be done. But I stopped thinking that way after a while and was like, okay, I really like this guy. Why not try something different? Why not just let that go, drop all of, all of the, the walls and allow him in and see what he does with it? And instead of creating more of a mess and tearing apart that foundation, he built those walls back up in that safety and for me, it took probably about that four or five months. Mm -hmm. And then it was just, it just was bliss from there. Like the weight lifted off my shoulders was enormous. When you look at the span of your life, mm -hmm. right? You said you were 32 or whatever you said you were mm -hmm. earlier. Six months of your life is a very small, it's mm -hmm. a millisecond. It's a blip in time. And to look back at that and see the person that you were. And then six months per later, the person that you became, that transformation is fucking quick. Yeah. And the catalyst is what I like to call that mm -hmm. because everybody has a catalyst for a reason to change, right? Mm -hmm. She was my catalyst. And and I, I've been very forthcoming about that because until we started having conversations, 
I didn't realize how much about me needed to be fixed because I'm not the fucking problem. Yeah. There's no way that I'm the problem. I got my shit together. I'm a business owner. I got money. I got new cars. I'm fucking dope. Wrong. <laughs> wrong having conversations that were just simple conversations where she would challenge my thought process didn't tell me i was wrong never never was like hey dumbass yeah but she would drop a one-liner and it would keep me up for three or four days and i would process the shit out of it and come back and be like no you're, you're right about that and then i would start looking into books that talk about whatever it was that we were discussing discussing that year transformation was leaps and bounds in terms of me and I've seen it with her over the last year with the podcast because she's had to have internal dialogue because of conversations that we've had on the podcast and things that's happened in her personal life and giving up that career because mm -hmm. she was a career woman and she gave up all of her dreams and aspirations to, to kind of help me do the things that I want to do. And it, it I'm going to look back on this 20 years from now and be like, that was a day. It feels like that was a day that we, we had this crazy transformation in a day. But that that change is worth it. And it, it, when you really make the decision to make that change, it's not very hard. How, how how what was it for you in terms of time frames? Because you went from a very similar past to me to being the gentleman that that does everything your woman needs. I have. I mean, that's a complex answer, though, because I was I always thought I had it all figured out. I always thought. I mean, just like you said, like, I've got my life together. I'm a touring musician. Everybody recognizes me. Now I'm a tattoo artist. All of a sudden, I've got this this social clout. All of a sudden, everybody wants to be a part of me. I leaned really hard into the the image that I was and forgot all about the person that I was. Right. I didn't I, I wasn't an alcoholic. I'm just a fucking party animal. Right. You know what I mean? And I, I, I embraced that. I owned it. From that point, man, I wound up in prison. I was hospitalized. I was lost in everywhere in this country at least fucking once. And... I don't know exactly where the transition occurred, but it was a struggle. It took me to going to prison. Didn't change my life. Didn't change mine either. Waking up in a hospital being told I died. Didn't change my life. I looked at the doctor and I was like, did not. You're talking to me. Right. You know what I mean? Like I challenged it with a sense of humor because I couldn't really understand what was actually occurring. What it was for me was a having a son um and b realizing that even at that point i wasn't the person he was going to need you know like being adopted i never really knew who i was supposed to be where i was supposed to be who i was attached to and i told myself the whole time having a son's going to be the first blood relative i've ever met and what i realized once i saw my son for the first time was there's nothing fucking different Yep. That connected by having my son, it connected me to my family. It connected me to him. It connected me to the people who were supposed to be in my life. But it also made me realize that I was spending a lot of my time with people who didn't value who I was as a person because of the idea. I'm no longer an idea with this infant staring me back in my eyes. I have to value the person that I am. And within that time, it just, it, it all became the snowball effect. The life that I've experienced from the prison to the hospitalization to having a son to, I mean, obviously meeting, meeting her and really just being like appreciated as an individual to, I mean, fast forward all the way to here. They're all experiences. They're all bleeps in time that are going to be little tiny mile markers along the lineage of who I can be, you know? So I don't, I, I guess I don't know who I am yet. And hmm. that's, what's really exciting about it all. Having a kid didn't change my life. I cried when my daughter was born, but I didn't, I didn't have, um, I, so the mental illness was very prevalent mm -hmm. up until probably I was like 30 years old. Yeah. Um, and I had a lot of shit that I had to work through, uh, though I cried and like had the love for my kid. Like I didn't have that connection. I don't have a, a love connection to anyone in my family besides my cousin, which yeah. is really weird. Um, like I, my, I found out ironically enough today, my dad is having a part of his lung removed because he has stage four lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I should be tore up over that. And I'm not like, I don't have that relationship with anyone. For me, my catalyst really was, I don't want to fuck this up. Yeah. So I'm going to do everything that I've ever seen in every chivalrous thing to make sure that I am that motherfucker so that I don't have to worry about her ever questioning anything in our lives. I think with with mine, I spent so long not realizing I was relying on other people to keep my mental health where it was or I could blame them for why my mental health mm -hmm. was what it was. Um, by seeing him for the first time, it made me realize like, 
fuck, someone's going to count on me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he's, he's going to grow up relying on me. I'm either going to be his hero or his hell. How old were you when you had your kid? Oh, he's fucking nine months old. Oh, okay. I was 17, so. Okay, yeah, no, my my son's nine months old, and I had done a lot of internal work through the process of um, my, my my son's mother and I just, we, we were toxically bonded. You know, we were... We were a mess. I was not great, but I was very self-assured that I was not the problem here. I get and, that. And e- even though I was producing a lot of value, I had started creating like momentum, being able to help other people. I didn't realize I wasn't applying my own strategies to my own personal life. I was great on my terms, but going home, there was slammed cabinets. There was misery. There was arguments. Things were never good enough. And I had to take a good hard look, take a few steps back and realize like I am my ideal client. I am my ideal artist I want to work with because even though my businesses were flourishing, even though I internally was flourishing between the 18 hours I was always away from the house, going home made me a failure, not successful. Right. And that was something we had talked about yesterday is what what constitutes is that. And so her and I ended amicably um, and that she she could not be fully in my life until one thing transitioned out and we knew my son was going to be safe and she was going to be safe. I provide for two households now and I take great pride in that because I can, I know that the mother of my son and my son are going to be safe under any circumstance and they value that. She knows that I'm going to be able to provide for us and we're going to be very safe because of being able to make that growth because nothing else is at fault, but the decisions that I make, as long as I know I'm making the next right decision, and every decision I make aligns with either authenticity, certainty, or intention, then I know I'm not just doing things out of convenience. Right. Mm-hmm. And that that was massive for me because I need core values. The minute I start forgetting about who it is I aspire to become or the minute is the minute I start doing things based on familiarity because it's just what's hardwired in my system. And hardwired, I'm a fucking mess. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I need a navigational system. That's that's a lot. Um, I, I want to touch on that real quick and just say that when it comes down to it, your past is learning experiences, but it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Right. Because it doesn't exist. Yeah. It's happened. So even if it was two weeks ago, if you've learned from it and you've started making yeah. changes, it doesn't matter. And people get so hung up in. I had a shitty childhood. No one will ever hire me because I have a felony from 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. It's excuses. These are the stories, the lies that we tell ourselves as to why we can't grow. Yeah. And when you realize that that's all bullshit and you start living right fucking now and worrying about the future and not living in it, but planning for it, your entire existence changes. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. You're either a student of the process or you're a product of your environment. Yeah. Or are you going to be a people pleaser? Or are you going to take yourself seriously and start to truly do the things that are going to best create the future you've always dreamed? Because then you can please the people within your life who deserve it. Mm-hmm. I spent a long time being a people pleaser, but wanting what was best for me. And what I did was I fucking hurt a lot of people along the path, including myself. And it's all a choice. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm within full accountability of all of that. And that's, that's about the most relieving experience I've ever had was knowing... I guess the serenity of it all. If, mm-hmm. if you understand, like, a lot of people use serenity and substance abuse. Grant me the serenity to accept right. the things I cannot change. You, you all know it. I know what the fuck is mine. But I also know I cannot be in control of other things. But as long as I remember the difference between the two, then my navigational path is always going to take us in the right direction. And it may not be what's going to best suit someone else, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not to do them wrong. It's to ensure the fact that I'm consistently doing what's going to be right. We still have 20 minutes. That was very quick. I what expected do you mean we that. Still have com- 20 minutes? Well, we, you said that you wanted to be done by two. Or do you have to leave here before then? Well, I, I'd like to get something to eat. Oh, okay. I sat in a line for two hours. Yeah, <laughs> I know. She gets to the school super fucking early so mm-hmm. that she can get up to the front of the line quicker, but she still sits there. Yeah. <laughs> right, but that means that from there I can go straight to get our daughter and then it's a 30 mm-hmm. minute drive home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I, I told you yesterday that, that you are a completion to my life and we had a moment in the kitchen. I, I listened to this and it makes me so fucking grateful for what I have because it's mirrored, Mm -hmm. right? It's one thing to, to see us because we live this. It's another to see people sharing the same life experience and being fulfilled and thriving. Mm -hmm. And it fucking, I left here yesterday on on cloud nine and got to go home and like experience a new, 
found appreciation for my relationship. So thank you guys for coming down here. I, I really enjoyed this. We did the same no. thing. Did you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, yeah. The minute we got in the car, I'm like, oh, it's so nice to know that someone sees exactly what we have and does what we do and doesn't judge it harshly because they don't have it. That what we have and what we've built is a is obtainable to other people that they just don't see it. Right. And not only that, like I, I put up that story where it was like, you know, we got to set, sit down with the two of you and we really learned to add value to the love and the appreciation that we have. Because how euphoric is it to be from the Midwest, to come down here, have these conversations, truly get to have that deep dive into who it is we are with two people who are extremely like-minded and have the same, like, the same story in so many different ways and then sit by a beach and reminisce on all of that and just right. gain closure from it is, I don't know, I, euphoric's the obvious word to use there, but sometimes you experience something you just can't put words right. to. Because it doesn't, it, it doesn't do it justice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's we have that conversation about love. Like, what a bleak word to define something so amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was, was that that love aggression? That, that's what that was. <laughs> it was. It was either that or I scream, and that was quieter. I liked that. Yeah, yeah. you want to grab you and give you shaking woman syndrome? Do the fucking dishes. <laughs> I don't even have to pay for that. What? So I won't even have to pay for that. <laughs> We have that same conversation. Uh, like, just just grab me and just hug me. Like, yeah. Get aggressive with me, or like he'll do something, he'll say something, and he'll be like, "You need to do this." I'm like, "Oh, could you tell me that again? Like one more time? <laughs> can you do that again for me? Like, get aggressive again. I I like that." We went to Home Depot before we came here because I had to get a, a receiver hitch because I am going to buy a trailer and quad yeah. set probably in the next forty eight hours. <laughs> But we were walking in Home Depot and one of my friends saw me and um, we had a brief discussion and somebody was coming down the aisle and I started to walk and she went to the side so he can pass. And I'm like, woman. And she like came to me and I was like, fuck that guy. When I walk, you follow. And she's like, whatever the fuck you say, daddy. And, like, <laughs> and there were people in the aisle, right? Yeah. And for, for us knowing that it's joking, but there's like a passion behind it. People are looking at us. <laughs> Scandalous. Yeah, we went. We went one time. We went to. Uh, Are you talking about corkscrew? <laughs> yeah, corkscrew preserve to take pictures of alligators and shit. And um, there people are out bird hunting. Mm -hmm. You know, like for photography, not actually super hunting. quiet. Yeah. And and everybody's whispering. And she's like 15 feet away. And the park ranger tells me that there's an alligator down there. And he starts walking. And I did that. And she turned and came right to me. And he looked at her and looked at me and looked at her and looked at me and nodded and just kept walking. <laughs> and there was like that silent validation. And when we got, we laughed about it the whole way home. But that's one of those core memories for us because yeah. we have hand signals and all of the shit that is ours. Mm -hmm. Um but it, it's fun. It's so cool to hear you guys do. And we do it in the shit. gym. Like we'll banter back and forth just like that. And there's this one guy that's in there in the morning. Cause they're not that many. It's three in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The hell's in the gym. And we'll go back and forth and we forget that there's other people there. And we'll say something like that. Like how we talk to each mm -hmm. other in that way. Like for us, it's, an, it's endearing yeah, it is. to someone else. They'd be like, what the wrong? The fuck, yeah. and he and he looked over and, he looked, and then he just and then he realized we were joking and he just starts laughing so now like it's almost like wherever we are in the gym like he almost follows in the beginning to like see what banter we have yeah, going between each other like so we like you need to get back in the kitchen I'm like jokes on you i like being in my kitchen <laughs> <laughs> well I mean, he, he had said uh i just wanted to make sure you guys weren't were, weren't being serious like Oh, we've never been more serious a day in our lives. <laughs> you, know, you, know, like you just drop it real deep and just it's the eye contact that sells it. But no, absolutely. And I think there's there's this unwavering connection that's created when you have that understanding. You have that 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 love and that bond. Like she can say some really uncouth shit to me in public and it's like oh, uh we're we're heading home right now. Yeah. Like and <laughs> I almost ruined our Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm fucking sitting next to my mom and get an ass photo at the dinner table at Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> if I looked I at know. her and looked at my phone and looked at her and looked at my phone and I'm like, you bitch. Yeah. Well, if I know <laughs> he's Sorry, in a situation, mom. I'll immediately be like, send. She did that shit to me at the bank one day too. Yeah. And I'm, I'm talking to the lady at the bank who's like, I've she's been my bank lady for like six years. Yeah. Like I know her, know her. And I open my phone and I'm like, blush. <laughs> So you could have like warned me because I, I it doesn't tell me there's a photo. It tells me there's a message. So I opened it up and, and it's just all the glory of peaches. Mm -hmm. The problem with the Apple Watch is once in a while your photo will pop up right on your screen. Oh. And so I'm sitting there tattooing a client. And all of a sudden I've got a nice, beautiful ass photo just sitting right on my wrist. We both just kind of. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna take a smoke what? break. Yeah. <laughs> gonna use the bathroom. Or he'll have like his apprentice check. So now I have to like double check because like there's times where I've sent something and then they go and they're like, I don't, this wasn't for me. Yeah. <laughs> like, sorry guys. So Not sorry. Well, let's wrap this up. Do you, I know, what time are you guys leaving? Are you leaving tonight or tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow okay. morning. Do you want to come back and do another episode or do you want to just call it and enjoy your vacation time? You guys got to do back. Prime tonight. And well, yeah, we're, we we're gonna, they don't do reservations. We're just kind of assuming we can stop by there yeah, by like yeah. 5.30 or 6 It'll, to get a yeah. table. It's going to be the busiest around that time frame. Mm-hmm. I would imagine so. You're like an hour wait. Okay, so, because I have a community call I have to run at 8.30. Mm-hmm. So I would imagine if we're there by 5.30, we're good to go. If we have a window of time, let's run it. Yeah. Okay, I'll text you after I okay. get, and we'll figure it out from there. Anything you want to add, Hotness? Mm-mm. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Pleasure. This was dope. You got to take us out. You oh, us I home. have to take us out? Oh, fuck. Yeah, I make sure my eyebrows look right. Mine always look that way. <laughs> and with that, remember you're the author of your own story. So grab a pen. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Did I do that? Yeah. Hey! <laughs>